Hello, everyone. Welcome to our uh, next iteration of Seek Us Online. Um, we have um, a wonderful group of guests that will be speaking with us. Um, we will take just five minutes to let folks um, log on and then we'll go ahead and get started. So um, in the past, it's been really wonderful for folks to just to share in the chat where you're coming from um, so we can see who's in the room and we're excited to have you all join. Thank you so much. I don't know how the weather is uh -huh, coming from Maine and New York. Mm -hmm. um, we have, we are having like one of those like super um, humid East Coast days down here. <clears throat> so hopefully you guys are having, enjoying some um, better weather and not quite so hot. Yeah, our friends in the West Coast are really struggling. Hey, Sonia, thanks for joining. Gail from Wyoming, it's great to have you here. Thanks, Elizabeth. Ah, this will be a good panel for you, studying inclusivity in sex ed. We need to get you some credits. <laughs> I really love this, these programs and just seeing where everyone is coming from and what you're doing and just all of the amazing faces and folks that are really doing the hard work. Ah. Deborah left me and went to Florida. I see how it is. <laughs> All right. Okay, we'll just take another minute or two to let folks um, jump on and then we'll go ahead and get started. Because as you know, if you've joined us before, these um, events are um, really robust conversations and this is gonna be another good one. So I actually might just wait like one more minute before we get started. Hello, Rena from Pittsburgh. Do we have any international friends that have joined us today? Love to love to see if we've if uh, our friends from over the across the seas and up and down have joined us. <laughs> All right, I'm going to go ahead and get started just so that we um, can stay on schedule and make sure if there are questions, um, we have plenty of time for them. Um, so thank you everyone for, for joining us. Um, our Seek Us Online is one of our new programs that we started just last summer. Um, it's so wonderful to have you all here. Uh, I'm Chris Harley, I'm president and CEO of Seek Us. Seek Us was founded in 1964 to be the voice for shame-free education on human sexuality and to be a champion for sexual and reproductive freedom as an essential part of the human experience. Uh, we assert that sex education is a powerful vehicle for social change, and we are the only national organization that is solely focused on advocating for the rights of all people to accurate information, comprehensive sex education, and the full spectrum of sexual and reproductive health services. At CECUS, we believe that sex ed can spark social change at the nexus of many social justice movements, 
from racial justice and LGBTQ rights to the Me Too movement and urgent conversations around consent and healthy relationships. So thank you for joining us uh, with this next uh, in, uh, installation of Seek Us Online, which is a series of virtual armchair discussions that has been sponsored by the Vibe, the Vibe um, which is a company that explores how sex education can be a vehicle for social change with leading experts in the field. Vibe's core mission is to empower exploration through education and by offering a constant array of accessible content, carefully written guidance and real world information. Um, and the brand promotes inclusivity and informed play. So Seek Is Online is really an effort to explore some of these uh, up important new latest topics within sex ed and with the folks who know the most about them. Um, all of the proceeds from CECUS online events support the invited speakers and uh, CECUS's work advancing progressive sex education policy across the United States. So tonight, <clears throat> we're going to be doing a deeper dive into LGBTQ inclusive uh, sex, uh, inclusivity in sex education. And we're really just going to be talking with folks who have been at the forefront of bringing LGBTQ inclusive and focused sex ed programs into uh, the field. Before we begin, I wanna go over a couple of housekeeping items. Um, so one, we are using Zoom, which means that all of the participants are muted and video cameras are off. So if you have any comments or uh, reactions that you wanna share, please use the chat function. Um, that can be seen by all audience members, or you can also just chat with the speakers. There's also a Q&A box that we will invite you to use to submit any questions that you have for the speakers. And these will be moderated so that we can pull those questions for the Q&A session at the end of the event. We will do our best to answer as many questions as we can. Uh, and if we're not able to respond, we'll also try to do our best to collect those unanswered questions and provide you with a response after the event. This webinar is being recorded and uh, closed captioning will be made available on the recording uh, for all who have registered for the event. Um, the event, uh, I'm sorry, the recording will be um, posted to the CECUS website um, a week after this event, event concludes. Uh, as with many nonprofit organizations, the coronavirus pandemic and resulting uncertainty did impact CECUS and the support for our work. So this event is a, uh, intended to be a fundraiser for CECUS. And so we invite you to visit www.secus.org backslash donate to make a contribution so that CECUS can continue to work with federal, state, and local governments to advance comprehensive sex education uh, programs and policies. So with that out of the way, um, I'm now excited to introduce you to our speakers um, and then we'll go ahead and get started. Um, I just, I can't tell you, uh, since I've joined Sika is being introduced to these um, amazing individuals and the work that they're doing has been one of the most exciting aspects of my job. Um, and so this is a, a conversation that we've been talking about and planning for quite some time. So I'm glad it's starting to happen now. Uh, so first we have Heather Karina, uh, who uses they, them pronouns. Uh, Heather is a dedicated queer feminist activist, author, educator, artist, teacher, organizer, and innovator, um, who is also the founder, director, designer, and editor um, of the web clearinghouse and organization Scarletine, which many of you likely know. Uh, and uh, is, Heather is also the author of um, several books now, um, including SEX, the All You Need to Know Sexuality Guide to Get You Through Your Teens and Twenties, uh, Wait What, a Comic Book Guide to Relationships, Bodies, and Growing Up, and uh, in 2021, so just recently released, uh, What Fresh Hell Is This? Perimenopause, Menopause, and Other Indignities in You, a guide. So if you have questions about any portion um, of your experience, Heather is uh, the go-to uh, book author. We also have Mira Wheel, who is a doctor of Tibetan medicine, certified sexual health educator, and the lead author of Let's Original Program, Teach, Affirm, Learn, and Know, or Talk curriculum. Uh, Mira is a queer femme identified woman and a current doctoral student 
and Spalding Spitz Fellow in Community Health Education at UMass Amherst. Uh, Laura, Laura Gardner uh, is a program manager at Planned Parenthood Great Northwest Hawaii, Alaska, Indiana, and Kentucky, or PPGNHAIK, uh, where she manages the INCLUDE program. And INCLUDE is a brand new program um, that is an evidence-based LGBTQ-centered sex, sexual health education program that's being implemented around the country um, that centers the needs of LGBTQ youth and uh, health, health center staff. Forever Moon is a community outreach educator also at PPGNHAIK. Um, and Forever has been engaging in some type of sex ed work uh, since they were 17 uh, and now works in Olympia, Washington as a sex educator. Uh, Forever is passionate about working with and empowering youth and their commitment to doing work that is rooted in social justice and intersectional uh, and using an intersectional lens. Uh, they have been working on delivering and, and currently training sex educators in LGBTQ specific sex ed curriculum. So that's who we've got in the room today. I am really excited for this conversation. I'm just gonna go ahead and get started. I've got a couple of uh, questions that I've prepared for the speakers so, so that we can you know, just have um, an initial dialogue with each other and then we'll open it up to Q&A. So my first question is for Heather. Um, I wanted to start with you because in 2016, you know, back when most organizations were still focused on teen pregnancy prevention as um, sort of the guiding rationale for why, you know, sex education programming was necessary, Scarletine launched the slogan, Queer Sex Ed for All, um, which really feels like it was um, an, an early predecessor uh, to the effort to talk about sex education differently and outside of that teen pregnancy prevention focus. So can you just talk a little bit about what you were um, trying to call attention to um, in terms of the need for queer sex ed and why you, um, you know, started this slogan um, and, you know, um, you know, in some ways uh, started a rallying cry around the need for queer sex ed for all. Sure. You know, so really at the time we were kind of looking for we were looking for a slogan to talk about ourselves and to kind of sum up what we'd been doing since the late 90s. We had a, a couple different ways of talking about the work that we'd done. Um, and, you know, slowly but surely there were like little breadcrumbs of people kind of starting to talk about inclusivity, but the way at that time that inclusivity and sex ed was being talked about was in this very limited, straight centered way, right? That was like, maybe just maybe people would mention in the sex ed that they were given that like, it was okay to be queer or trans. Um, it was still almost always not only being written by and taught by straight people or ostensibly straight people, right? In this very straight way. Uh, and you could feel it, you know? And so for us, you know, I'm a queer person, right? So I, I there's, there's, I can't, I can't write straight sex ed. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how I would do that. There's, I don't know what that would mean or how that would look like. I, it, it would be, it would be fantasy fiction for me, right? <laughs> I don't even know what that is. And so we've only ever, as queer people, kind of been able to make queer sex ed. And so for us, you know, sex ed being inclusive is a way bigger sphere. It certainly means that we want what we're doing to include content that is relevant for queer and trans youth, right? And obviously, you know, certainly that includes pregnancy prevention. I mean, I do remember also at the time, you know, early in the 2000s, there was a stats came out that made their way to straight people that queer youth were getting pregnant and straight people were like, what, how does this happen? You know, and all of the rest of us, well, one, know exactly how it happens, but, but also have seen this happen and know that this happens. You know, we want everything to be there, but we, it comes from a bigger sphere. You know, it comes from a place of relationships and a place of community and a place of pleasure and a place of embodiment and a place of identity. And inclusivity also isn't just for, you know, about who it's for. It's also about who it's from. Um, 
And kind of the third piece of that for us is that we don't think that queering up sex ed just benefits queer people. We think that it really benefits everybody. You know, a super, super heterosexual, cissexist script for sexuality really doesn't benefit anybody. It really limits everyone. You know, it certainly limits queer and trans people grossly, but it also really limits cisgender and heterosexual people quite a lot. I mean, if you listen, they're, they're, they're yelling it, <laughs> you know, they're yelling it to everybody, you know, so for us, you know, that's kind of what we wanted to make clear. I, you know, I remember kind of early on starting as a queer sex educator, having people kind of find out that I was and like, say it like they were trying to out me, like it was some kind of secret, like, ah, oh, this queer person is teaching sex ed, you know, and so it, it's nice that we're finally, slowly, surely <laughs> starting to arrive at this place where it's not this thing where, you know, you can have, we're seeing now with our volunteers, younger queer people coming into sex ed where they know that they come in as an asset. They're not having to come into the work feeling like they have to fight really hard for their right to be here and why they're an asset to be here, they know that they are. So that's kind of the broader scope that we were trying to bring to the table. Yeah, that's amazing. And, um, you know, and I think to be holding those kinds of conversations and offering um, those kinds of resources, uh, you know, over the entirety of Scarlet Teen's history is just um, really incredible. Um, so, Laura, I wanted to ask you um, about Include. So in, in 2020, uh, Planned Parenthood, your Planned Parenthood uh, announced the release of your Include sex ed curriculum, which is an important LGBTQ inclusive um, uh, resource. And Mira, um, you have also been working on uh, and acting as the lead author of the Liberatory Education's original program, Teach, Affirm, Learn, and Talk. So I just wanted to hear from you guys, you know, if you could share the origins of your efforts to create these programs, why you felt it was necessary uh, to undertake those, uh, this task, and, and sort of the origin story of your work. Sure. Thank you, Mira. I can dive in. Um, hi, everybody. It's so nice to be here. And you know, the origin of include, I mean, I think there are a lot of parallels to what Heather's talking about too. I mean, for us, we received an opportunity to be funded through um, the Office of Adolescent Health, so the government to create a program, which is um, in and of itself kind of um, a great example of how far we've come in some regards. Um, so we were, you know, at our Planned Parenthood affiliate, we received this wonderful five-year grant. Um, and the reason that we wanted to apply for it, the reason we um, wanted to create a program like Include was because of a lot of the health disparities that Heather referred to, right? Um, they, they have only become, um, even though there isn't nearly enough data out there related to the LGBTQ community, um, there's enough that shows us uh, the health disparities that exist, especially for LGBTQ youth. So around unintended pregnancy, around STIs, um, and also I think for us, it was important to not just create um, an, a sex ed program that was for LGBTQ youth, but in addition, we really wanted to be able to provide the training that was so clearly lacking um, in, the, in the healthcare um, setting as well. And so our program is this dual approach. It's providing sex ed to youth um, while also providing um, some much needed training to health center staff of all roles and responsibilities as well, so that um, the onus is not just on youth to have that knowledge, um, which is also super important, but they also can access the sexual health care that they so need and deserve, right? Um, and so that was kind of the catalyst to create this program. And we, um, for us, it was also super essential to center the voices of these youth, like find out what it was they wanted and then give them just that. So um, so at the very beginning, um, we did like a community assessment of sorts where we went around the country and talked to uh, queer and trans youth about the sex that they were receiving, what they 
wanted to receive, um, as well as like kind of what they wanted out of their experiences at a, with a provider, like at, at a sexual health care appointment. Um, and so from that learning, we were able to create the include curriculum, um, which is which has now finished undergoing a rigorous um, randomized controlled trial evaluation, which is um, really wonderful and heartening. And as one can imagine, also challenging to measure a marginalized population in that way. So that was a journey in and of itself. Um, but it was important for us to be able to have that data, to be able to be on the list, if you will, of um, programs that folks can access easily or more easily to be able to provide the, um, the sex ed that all youth and you deserve. And just like Heather was saying, like it's, it, it is LGBTQ centered, but, on, but it is for all youth, absolutely. Um, so I'll, I'll take a breath there because I'd love to hear about Mira's work as well. Laura, and thank you, Chris. So nice to hear from you, Heather. Um, so I'll take a little bit more of a, a personal tack on this answer. Um, also because our program, Let's Talk, is a much smaller scale. It's uh, just right now in one state in Massachusetts. Um, and the impetus to develop this program personally came from you know, my experience as a clinician and as a sexuality ed educator. I saw a lot of adults come in um, with very little knowledge and understanding about their own sexuality, um, sexual health, physiological functions that have to do with fertility and sexuality, and also a lot of dis-ease or illness that was rooted in some sort of um, harm, sexual harm. I was just seeing this over and over and over for a decade, and um, I really feel that prevention is much more effective um, than reaction. So that's where kind of my personal drive to do early childhood sexuality education came from. And then similar to Heather, as a queer person, there was no way that I could be part of creating a curriculum that wasn't completely inclusive of queer and trans people because it's who I am and that's who my lovers are. Um, and similarly, uh, sort of what both you have been saying, Heather and Laura, Queer sex ed is not just for queer people. Inclusive sex ed is actually inclusive of so many identities, not just sexual identities and gender identities. To me, inclusive sex education is also anti-racist, it's body positive, it's fat positive. And so it's actually inclusive of human diversity and that can't be anything but good. And I think that I have a, I have a strong belief that starting that kind of inclusive sexuality education young, again, is, is preventative. So it's, it's not about unlearning, it's about just introducing these kind of positive inclusive frameworks young. And that really feels like a seed for social change. Um, and when you're working with youth, of course adults are gonna be involved, either as the educators themselves who will receive training from us or Planned Parenthood or another qualified educator, or just the adults that they interact with. And so this kind of woven uh, seeds for social change, I feel is really at the heart of sex education. I'm muted. So can you talk a little bit, am I still muted? Can you hear me? No. You're good. Oh, okay. Um, so I wanted to ask you, though, if you could share a little bit about the um, partnership that you developed and how talk as a curriculum um, started to get implemented. Thank you. Yeah, sorry not to include that part. So I'm a PhD student currently at UMass. Um, I got my master's in public health directly before starting my PhD. And as a master's student, I connected with a local public elementary school actually through my advisor, who's also part of this project and a, a good friend whose children were at this public elementary school. And it, the partnership came about because some parents in a PTO meeting 
expressed the wish for a gender neutral bathroom. And it met with a lot of um, flack and it sort of opened some parents' eyes to the real lack of uh, queer and trans inclusion in their school and community, which is, is a pretty liberal community. And I, see, I think some parents were kind of surprised that that was the case. And so then um, several parents came forward uh, with a interest in having sexuality education in their school, which was, it's a K through six grade elementary school. And they have, um, at the time they had sex ed in fifth and sixth grade that I think was a two day unit at the end of the school year. So that was kind of how the beginning of the community partnership began with parents coming forward with an interest. And um, as a researcher, as well as a curriculum developer, I came to the table with uh, the framework of community-based participatory research, which means that from the very first conversation through the community assessment, the needs assessments, and then you know deciding what to do with it, the development of the curriculum, it was in collaboration with um, parents, teachers, the principal, administrators, superintendent, curriculum director, all working together in an iterative uh, process. And so subsequently, we developed a curriculum and it has been implemented now in this public school. This will be the fourth year that we've gotten to implement and do evaluations. We, we don't have the funding for the kind of rigorous evaluation that you have been able to do at Planned Parenthood, but um, I'm hoping to potentially maybe one day get it. That's amazing. I, I, I didn't know that backstory and that's really incredible to just have that happen organically and as folks are responding to what is necessary and needed in their community. Um, so this question is for uh, Forever and for Mira. So you are both currently working you know, with young people and witnessing the differences in their experience with the different programs that you offer. Um, you know, Mira, you're working directly with schools and educators and parents um, to expand the talk curriculum um, as you are able to uh, reach higher grade levels. Um, and, and so I wondered if, if both of you can talk a little bit about, you know, what is different in include and in talk um, than what is found in other CSC programs, right? Because uh, you both, well, you know, Mira, you kind of talked about inclusive curriculum just being inclusive of, of the human experience. And yet, you know, we need these revolutionary programs that you're implementing now um, to help grow um, the field. So I'd love to just hear you talk about what's different and what makes these curriculum um, specifically tailored uh, to meet the needs of queer and uh, LGBTQ youth. Um, and what do you see other curriculum uh, missing? I'll go. Hey, everyone. Um, so names forever. And yeah, I, I always think of like the name of our program is include, um, which I think really sparks that idea around inclusivity. Um, and include is unique because it's more than that. It's LGBTQ plus centered content. So this like LGBTQ related content was um, just like centered from the very get go. I'm thinking of our community assessment, asking queer and trans youth what they want out of sex ed and using that as our foundation to develop this unique program that not only in, uh, incorporates content around sexual health, um, but also accessing sexual health services, um, which I think is another uh, unique aspect of this program. We give youth tools and, and time to kind of practice um, what it looks like to get those sexual health needs met. Um, and there are many examples, I think, through our content um, that makes it LGBTQ centered from acknowledging in our curriculum the stigma and systemic oppression that LGBTQ plus the LGBTQ plus community can face as well as I think systemic oppression that just exists in our nation as a whole. Um, while also naming and honoring the pillars of our LGBTQ plus history um, and diving deeper and expanding on conversations around safer sex um, uh, kind of 
uh, materials and, and things to access. And so the demonstrations we do talk about internal and external condoms, dental dams, lube, um, really making sure to um, talk about the wide breadth of availability and why someone might use it and really like get into those details. So that's one way that I see include as super unique, which is like in the curriculum and outside of the curriculum. Include also just creates a wonderful, unique environment where uh, facilitators and youth uh, really create a like community centered space where um, we're listening to folks and each other um, and our feedback just tells us how much LGBTQ youth love being surrounded um, and connecting with their community and that that part um, uh, was some of their favorites. I have so many more examples and happy to share them, but that's kind of like those golden nuggets that I see that include really, really has to shine. Thanks, Trevor, and thanks, Chris, for the question. Um, I would say so just to so all the participants know the Let's Talk curriculum is for younger kids. It's for right now kindergarten through grade four. So we're looking at educating, um, you know, people ages five through nine ish. So um, our approach is a little bit different. <clears throat> because we're not, so, we're not doing a ton of talking about safe sex. We're not doing any talking about safe sex yet. Uh, so I would say some of the ways that it's queer and trans centered, although I, we use the word affirming, but centered works too, um, is that you know, from the very start, we talk to the, we train the educators and facilitators about using gender inclusive language, uh, which looks like, you know, instead of, addressing a classroom as boys and girls or, or having you know, them line up by sex uh, to go out to recess. We encourage them to use words like, hey everybody, or hey kids, or hey folks, or hey class, you know, and divide, divide the room by color of your shirt or the first letter of your last name. Um, so uh, I would say that those kind of important, uh, but somewhat subtle ways of including people who aren't boys and girls who are trans or non-binary or genderqueer um, is really integral throughout the whole curriculum in addition to having specific lessons about it. Uh, we also, we talk explicitly about a wide variety of diverse family structures, um, not just to include you know, queer and trans, parenting models, but also intergenerational parenting models, um, ways that lots of different cultures can look in households. Uh, we also talk explicitly about gender roles and gender identity formation, which is really fun and exciting at that age because it's, it's happening so actively. And so we, we talk about it in a really sort of open and free and celebratory way, including you know, that it is something that can evolve and change throughout the life course. Um, and while this isn't explicitly about queerness, our curriculum is, uh, in, every lesson includes an embodiment activity or an arts-based creative activity. And, and those are meant to help both students and facilitators both basically like get into our bodies and learn to develop more relationships with our own bodies, listening to our intuition, kind of getting to know what it feels like um, to use your body as a guide. So while that's not explicitly about queerness, it feels like an important part of what makes our curriculum different. That's, that's beautiful. I mean, it's interesting. I, my children uh, just finished uh, pre-K. Um, so, and it was, and it was interesting, like sitting there, like trying to support them in online schooling, which is horrific for being in pre-kindergarten, but hearing all the times where gender was like made explicit and they were making these binaries. And I was like, no, 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 it's totally fine. Like for you to like whatever color or whatever. Um, so I think that's really 
important um, that you're helping both educators think about, you know, more uh, broader inclusive um, language and ways of differentiating opinions and um, and then also giving young people the the guidance to like think about these things. That's beautiful. Um, God, I love it. <laughs> um, so my my next question is for Heather and Trevor. Um, so you've both been working um, for a really long time uh, advocating for sex ed curriculum that affirms the identities of young people, um, that centers the identities of queer folk, um, and you know, and then have been working hard to create and provide resources that meet those needs. And so I just wanted to hear a little bit more from you about what you have witnessed being the impact on young people in terms of you know, differences in their reaction and identity presentation, personal growth and development, um, when you are able to provide resources or programming that validates um, queer experiences and identities for self-identifying queer and LGBTQ youth, and um, for the straight youth who also receive um, and, and seek out this support and resource. Trevor, you wanna go first or do you want me to go first? Let's have you go first and then I'll, I'll follow. Thank okay, you. Sure. Um, I mean, one of the things that's interesting, of course, is that, you know, we, we don't always know how everybody identifies. Now, with Scarletine, more often than not, um, when we're working one on one with people, you know, a lot of our content is static. And so people are just reading it and we're not interacting with them at all. Uh, in the parts of the services where we are interacting with them and people are filling out a profile, people will sometimes fill out orientation and identity stuff, but they won't always, right? So we don't always know. And in outreach, you know, we almost never know, you know, especially if, if you go in a classroom and we're doing it that way. Obviously, it's not something that we ask people when we walk in, so it's not something we know. Some, sometimes it's one of those things where you'll certainly find out after. I mean, one way that we'll almost always find out after is that, you know, if it is usually said or it, or it comes out in any part of the presentation, whether it's an outreach presentation or it's something where somebody's reading it or we're doing a one-on-one -on -one in direct services where a young queer trans person finally gets to actually interact with another queer or trans adult who's giving them this information, that is often major for everybody, especially if it's a first time that someone's been able to do that. Not only, sometimes it's the first time anyone's even been able to have any kind of contact with another queer or trans person, let alone to be able to ask these kinds of questions of that person. And sometimes it's also the first time they've been able to ask another adult questions about sex and sexuality, right? Like all of those things are happening. So sometimes it's a very big day. <laughs> and sometimes that can also be the case for straight youth that it's the first time that they've talked to another queer or trans person. You know, one thing that will sometimes happen with Scarletine is that, you know, we, the way that we're inclusive is, is pretty low key. You know, we like rainbows and sparkly things, but it's not all over absolutely everything. And so it's it happened many, many times that we've been in conversation with someone and they won't quite realize that where they are is a very inclusive space because it's a very inclusive space and someone will say something that one of us will find offensive. And so we'll gently say, hey, whatever it is, I'm a queer person or I'm a trans person or I'm a non-binary person. And just so you know, that hurts my feelings or whatever. And then that person, you know, in again, sometimes that's the first time that that straight or cisgender young person has had another interaction like that with somebody, that can be a very big deal, especially when it's gentle, you know, and it's not, there can be conflict, but they realize that they can have conflict with someone like that and nobody's screaming and yelling, the world is not falling apart, nobody's gonna call them names, they don't have to call anybody else names, nobody's back is up, everything's fine. And in fact, we can even still, they can still ask their question. You know, my feelings can be hurt, we can process my hurt feelings and they can do that. Um, you know, I think another thing in that, 
mixed space is that for us in our community spaces to be able to have youth of all kinds of identities really makes clear, you know, culture still tells everyone, especially young people, that there's this, you know, firm straight line between cis and trans and between queer and straight, which is not reality. You know, you know like that's not, that's not how it actually is. But the perception that is, is, is still there. And so to give people the space to coexist and to, you know, to see the places that everyone overlaps, whether that overlap is in their questions, in their concerns, in their experiences, in their needs, I think is often really revelatory. It gives them all often a lot of um, room to feel more fluid in their identities. Um, and again, that gives straight and cis youth more room. That gives queer and trans youth more room. Everybody kind of needs a little more room in that respect. So, you know, those are kind of those are some of the, there's so many things really, but those are some of them. I wanna make sure that Forever has some space as well. Yeah, oh, oh, so good. I'm very reflective. So I'm just like sitting here soaking up all of what y'all are saying. Um, and one of the first things I thought about was I started my like professional edu sex educator career, like with Planned Parenthood being trained and include. And so as I went out into the, community and worked with other lesson plans, I was so excited to like put inclusiveness in, like talk about like queer trans youth um, and growing pains occur, right? I walked away from a classroom with an anonymous question that said, I didn't hear myself in that curriculum. I didn't like, did you talk about queer and trans people? And I was like, whoa, um, like that is something that I need to work on and I need to understand like what it feels like to like walk into a space, be ex explicit and not just like neutral. Um, and working with Include as a program gave me kind of the like safeguard to do that. It's a one time three hour program um, that we were offering to folks who were 14 to 19 years old. And we were talking about topics around like gender and sexuality, sexual health, accessing those healthcare services. And like those are topics that everyone can benef benefit from. Um, and a lot of echoing of like what we've said around um, this foundational curriculum being um, helpful for, for queer and trans youth as well as straight identified youth. And as we work with more communities, it was like it, like we learned it was imperative to also invite allies to these workshops and invite queer and questioning youth, um, both so everyone feels comfortable attending regardless of where they're at in their being out journey. Um, and because this training is for everyone, um, the uh, part of the like, witnessing that I did really also comes in their like qualitative feedback. Like when we ask youth, like what was your favorite part of the workshop? They'll say something like, I learned about birth control that was inclusive to me and my needs. And we're like, score, did it. Um, but they'll also say like being surrounded by queers or I like, I felt included as a trans person and really comfortable. And so that community building aspect, again, is just like highlighted um, that, 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 environment to be explicit and to be heard and to be seen and ask the questions that they uh, want to explore um, is just like, like witnessing being in that space is I think, uh, and coming out of that space, this uh, program again was three hours, we added an hour for our evaluation. Um, so after four hours, the queer and trans youth in the room wanted to stay with us wanted to stay with each other. We're exchanging social media, making big sharing. And so that connection and the learning that happened in the room together um, outside of like us facilitators um, was, was like exactly what we wanted to encourage and really like contrasted, right? With like what we heard in our community assessment around like what folks weren't getting out of their sex ed experiences. It wasn't relevant. It wasn't speaking to their identities and relationships that were, they were having. And then, yeah. And last, I'll just say that like, um, 
kind of regarding what youth get out of our program, um, we definitely, I love talking about qualitative data. Um, and it's also important for us to mention that our quantitative results after the rigorous RCT also showed positive results, um, specifically regarding self-efficacy and knowledge, as well as accessing sexual health care and um, kind of uh, their own thoughts and behavior around sexual behavior. Um, and our positive results were even greater for BIPOC and gender expansive youth. So those who like did not identify as cisgender in our service, surveys, um, which is really who we wanted to center and those who need it most. So that was really awesome to see in the results. Yes, definitely don't forget the quantitative evidence. <laughs> um, no, I think that that's, that's amazing. Uh, you know, and it does, I think that just the opportunity to be in conversation where all identities are being explored and, and, and allowed and, and celebrated must feel so re re um, revelatory and uh, powerful for the folks that are, you know, going to Scarletine and seeing resources that speak to their identities or sitting in these programs where, you know, instead of feeling like they're, you know, people are being ignored or, well, you know, I identify this way, but I like this thing. And is that allowed, right? Like just even like that basicness. Um, uh, and, you know, I think that something that you said, Heather, uh, of like, and just imagine like being in conversation spaces where where folks of different identities are like finding commonality and like that also being like a demystifying force right that um like i feel like we need because we just end up in these silos that like only people are supposed to be certain ways and and that not being true so um yeah that's uh, it's yeah, it's great to it's great to hear <laughs> the work that you're doing, and I'm glad that we're being able to have this conversation about these programs. And you know, and the fact that like they all like you've all just been starting to release these, you know, just in the last couple of years. That Scarlet Teen has been around for 20 years, but you know that these curriculum are just coming out and emerging is really powerful. Um, so my last question, and we'll turn it over to Q and A, is for Laura and for Mira. Um, can you offer any strategies for the sex educators that are um, participating and listening to this program can use um, to adopt or shift um, and implement a more inclusive or centered approach to their own sex ed programming um, if it hasn't, if it wasn't developed to be specifically tailored for queer and LGBTQ youth? Um, and how would you recommend this kind of soft adaptation of existing programs? Um, or I guess, would you recommend that kind of soft adaptation of existing programs, or would you recommend more assertively centering the needs of queer and LGBTQ youth in terms of, um, you know, achieving the, the greatest benefit and outcome for young people? I can dive in. Um, there are so many wonderful parts to that question, and um, I mean, I'm trying to figure out where to start. I mean, the everybody's community and the ability to implement certain curricula is just so varied. Um, Forever and I learn that all the time when we're talking to, um, well, the folks who are working on Include, but even just within our um, Planned Parenthood affiliate, we span six states from Hawaii to Indiana and every community is so different and like not every community can implement a program like include or an LGBTQ centered program. Um, and so like, would I recommend a soft adaptation of an existing program? Like, absolutely. And would I recommend more assertively centering the needs of queer and LGBTQ youth? Absolutely. So if you could do it all, then do it all. Um, I mean, include specifically um, is, not the panacea, right? It's a three hour workshop. So you're not going to be getting all of the rich depth and content of a comprehensive sex ed program in that one time um, experience. Um, it is a wonderful complement to other um, sex ed curricula for sure. Um, I think at adapting existing curricula is just absolutely necessary, um, you know, and I think about the experiences that I've had with my colleagues when they're working with 
frankly, like pretty heteronormative, cis normative curricula that just need a lot of need a lot of work, need a lot of massaging. Um, but even you know, if that's not the case, even if it's a pretty um, solid lesson, it won't stay that way for long. Like our, you know, like language is evolving all the time. You know, the first iteration of include that was drafted over five years ago needs a refresh, right? And so that's the beautiful thing, especially about working with in the, the LGBTQ community. Um, I remember early on in my career, before I was even in sex ed, and I, I, I had a workshop with a bunch of queer youth, and I was so proud of myself for coming out as bi. And then I, you know, as the youth are going around the room, and like the majority of them were identifying as pansexual. And I was like, pansexual? Oh my gosh. Okay, well now I need to get with it because like now apparently my term isn't nearly as you know what is in or whatever whatever it might be but it's just like a specific example that like the beautiful thing about language that's exemplified in our community and so um in terms of a specific suggestion because I know sometimes that can be helpful um you know if folks are wanting to like inclusify <laughs> their lessons which I know is just the reality right folks are working with grants they're working with specific lessons that they just have to implement for their jobs. That's just what they're um, required to do. Um, and it would be to take a close look at the curriculum and to think critically about the changes that you can make. Maybe you can't make all the changes you want. Maybe there's a handout that cannot be edited, but you can change the way that you talk about it or facilitate on it. Um, you know, maybe the birth control handout talks about male and female condoms. And so you can have a conversation with the folks in your room about why those terms are problematic and the terms that actually should be used. Um, or maybe, you know, a lot of uh, curricula have role plays, scenarios, characters. Think about what identities are being represented and which are not, and being really thoughtful about including a variety of identities. Um, and for some folks, maybe the most you can do is to be gender neutral, right? To be a bit more intentionally vague, because. Um, the relationships you have, the community you're in, you know, you can only push the bar so far. Um, but being thoughtful about how far you can push, I think, is important. Um, and making those tweaks, whether it's to the pronouns of that scenario, um, character and, or a name, um, the relationship that's being represented. Um, I think the more that more youth can see themselves in a lesson and there will undoubtedly always be LGBTQ youth in the room, um, the better. And so I think there are a lot of options for folks that will be really dependent on their context for sure. Those are great suggestions, Laura. I agree with all of them. I also totally agree that soft adaptation um, is a great first step. I mean, grassroots change starts with us making small changes. So absolutely any changes you can make, do it. And also if you're in a position to be an advocate for more rigorous and inclusive sex ed as a program, do that. Um, but any small changes I think can make a huge difference actually. Some specific changes or um, additions, adaptations that I think really would work for sexuality education of any age are things like um, using gender inclusive language, like I was talking about before, um, not just during the lessons of the sex ed, but in your classrooms. That can be a pretty big deal that makes people who are trans or genderqueer or non-binary all of a sudden visible, um, which is pretty powerful. Uh, in the lessons themselves, if you can just add in uh, words like queer and um, maybe this will require a little bit of uh, self-education on your part, but to make sure that when you're talking about sex and coupling, you just use words other than heteronormative sort of words and stories. Um, also, Adding in books and resources, and again, you know, this will vary depending on the age range, but books and resources that center queer and trans people or characters. There's like some amazing young adults novels um, with queer characters and trans characters that, you know, can be kind of a little more easy to slip through the cracks, if particularly if you're in a conservative community. Um, and again, that's true, like you know, five through 18, there's, there's a ton of great books. And 
resources too, just offering, you know, making your own resource list or writing it on the board if you can't have something that remains in print. Um, for instance, Scarletine is an amazing resource. I think probably all of our websites have some good resources on them. Uh, you could ask the students to generate a list of resources as a class so that you can compile it in a way that perhaps you have less responsibility for if there's a need to protect yourself from you know, district administration. Um, let's see, I had another specific suggestion. Maybe that was it. I think those are my specific suggestions. Mira, there was a question from Casey around, can you give an example of what a lesson around gender roles would look like in a K through 12 uh, setting? Yeah. It seems like a good time to slip that in. Yeah. So um, one of the, our, our lesson around gender includes a conversation where we ask kids, um, to say if there's anything that they've ever felt like they can or can't do because of their gender. So a conversation starter. Um, and then, you know, the kids talk to each other, um, things start to come up. Like I was told like I shouldn't play sports because I'm a girl, or I was told that I shouldn't wear pink because I'm a boy. And these are real life examples that, you know, five-year-olds come in saying and thinking, and then getting to you know, have a conversation as a class and talk about um, why that's not true. Give some examples. Oh, here's an example. You're a girl and you're really fast at running, things like that. So that's one way. Um, we also ask people to, We one of the activities is um, where kids get to draw themselves in five to 10 years, what they would wanna look like, what they think they might wanna be wearing, an activity they think they might wanna be doing. Um, and that comes after the conversation about, um, you know, whether they think they can or can't do something because, or they've been told they can or can't do something or heard other people say that girls or boys can or can't do something. So that sort of visionary drawing activity um, while, Again, it's a little more like a, of a subtle invitation for an opening into a, a future or self gendered identity of self that could look any way um, is meant to do that. Awesome, thank you. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna turn over now to uh, questions from the audience. So thanks to everyone who have been who have started to drop in your questions. Um, I will do my best to keep track <laughs> of all the screens. Um, so the first question is from Charlie. Um, and so Charlie says, um, something I come across a lot as a disabled educator who focuses on making sex education accessible to folks with disabilities is people saying that people with cognitive disabilities don't need basic sex ed at all, let alone sex ed that talks about queerness and transness. What are some ways to fight back against this idea that only certain kinds of people need sex ed? Um, and how do we fight for sex ed that is inclusive and accessible in these environments? And that's um, for anyone who wants to jump in. I can jump in very briefly. I, I think that reframing sexuality education as a, as a human right is helpful and um, I really like to cite the World Health Organization's definition of sexual health, uh, which talks about it as a basic human right, and it includes pleasure in their definition. Um, a lot of naysayers have a hard time disputing the World Health Organization. I'd add to that. I mean, there is a long and very nasty history is particularly in this country, but pretty much everywhere when it comes to people with intellectual and cognitive disabilities and their treatment around sex and sex ed. I mean, you've got lots of history of, for instance, people being non-consensually sterilized, people being non-consensually put on birth control and having that choice made for them. When the information is given, it's largely around and abuse and not even in the way that is necessarily 
protective of the person that it should be protecting. So, you know, one, I, I do think it's really important to acknowledge that it is absolutely a very ableist view to suggest that only people who do not have intellectual or cognitive disabilities could possibly be queer, right? That like weirdly puts queerness and transness in this like strange luxury category, right? Like I like it's it's such a messed up thing to even try and put words to, but I do think that the only place that you can even start with that and whether you were that um, politely or not, <laughs> obviously will depend on where you are, but I think that the first thing that you have to do is to call that out as an exceptionally ableist viewpoint as it and as it one more and Mira I think you put this really well one more injustice that is being put upon that population when it comes to another very long part of a history of being denied sex ed I mean I think another thing that we know and we're seeing this actually a lot around neurodiversity and transness for instance is that we know that the further that any of us are usually outside any of these you know normative systems the more likely it is that we're queer or trans anyway so the more likely it is that that is actually the sex ed that we need in the first place so it might be that an easier argument to simply make is to say if this is the basic sex ed that we need this is the basic sex ed that we need great um <clears throat> There's a question from Kate. Um, she feels conflicted about her queer students in online porn. Um, I know it can be one of the few places that they see queer sexuality, and yet she worries that sending them damaging that it's sending them damaging messages. So, do you have language for framing uh, pornography with queer teens? I can speak to this if it doesn't look like anybody else is jumping and racing at it. Um, I can throw two links in when we're done here with some pieces to start with. One of the best things I've ever heard in the world, um, there's a professor out of Australia, his name is Alan McKee. He's an absolute genius around sexual media. And the way that he uh, suggested an evaluative framework for sexual media, was to look at it around uh, pieces of healthy sexual development and to look at it in terms of what in any sexual media that we're looking at is supportive of healthy sexual development, what is neutral and what is negative, right? What stands in the way. I think that when we talk about pornography and other sexual media with young people, it's really important that we're as neutral about it as possible, right? Because like anything else, if anybody just says bad, 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 damaging, damaging, you've lost the room, <laughs> right? Uh, but I think, you know, it's media. So anything that we can do to help everybody think critically about any kind of media is a good thing. And when we're looking at pornography and we look at it in that framework, we can absolutely see things that it does that fit in those three groups. For instance, part of healthy sexual development is for sex to be something that is joyful. Most porn, people look like they're having a good time, right? It absolutely supports us in saying, yes, sex looks like fun. On the other hand, another part of healthy sexual development is that it should be consensual. Most porn does not support showing us how to do consent. So putting it, if you wanna really talk about it, I think in a way that it's easy for them to hear. That's one way where you can do it, where it's kind of, it's neutral, you know, it's very value neutral. You're having them look at it critically without saying bad, bad. I'm gonna put some links up to a piece that we have from one of my books about sexual media, but then another piece that is that uh, healthy sexual development framework that Alan McKee kind of gave that you could divide porn into if you wanna go ahead and do that. Thanks, Heather, that would be super helpful. Um, <clears throat> so some other questions that came in, um, this one's from Drew. As a psychotherapist, I feel especially sensitive to how uncertain or undetermined people can feel about their own gender and sexual identities. 
When you're providing comprehensive sex ed to young people, how do you affirm those who uh, don't necessarily know what, you know, have a, don't necessarily know what they are um, or how they identify aspect to their identity? Mira, would you take that one? Happily. Oh, sorry, forever. No, but no, forever, no. if you're gonna go, I think you should. I, I already answered a question. I think so. Um, just one of the first things um, that comes to my mind in, in one of the, like, the core aspects is that like identity does not dictate behavior. And so often when we're talking about how to keep ourselves safe, how to do risk assessment, um, how to access some of these sexual health services, um, we are talking about behaviors and their risk and making the distinction that um, like that, yeah, some folks may be still questioning or not sure or in that space. And that is okay. And, um, and like starting to think about these behaviors, what we might be interested in in our relationships are different things about ourselves and our identities uh, that sometimes can intersect with our own sexuality and gender and don't have to. So um, I think as I have those conversations around sexual health specifically, I'm just really highlighting that yeah, identity does not dictate behavior and how we make these decisions uh, about how we take care of ourselves and our bodies is attached to a whole plethora of, um, of ourselves and our holistic um, identities and values. I think that's it, really ahead, Oh wait, who is talking? Is that you, Chris? Yeah, no, I was making room for you. I was <laughs> walking over you at the same time. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say, I think that's a really important point and I appreciate that you brought that in. Um, I just wanna add, I think that in the classroom too, it can be pretty simple um, because the, the, the reality is that our identities, our gender identities and our sexual identities actually can change all the time and it's totally normal and really a part of it. So I think just holding that truth and offering it um, and believing it yourself as an educator or health provider um, can go a really long way to support people in their own journeys and processes. Um, here's another question. Um, so this one is from Lauren. In the program that Lauren is working on, um, they're trying to be inclusive of the participants' religions and also trying to avoid reinforcing the Christian-centric sexual lessons that many often give. How would you recommend handling a situation where a student is against LGBTQ identities and issues because of their religion without alienating the queer youth in the group or shutting down the importance of religion and I guess faith in, um, in participants' sexual values? formation? That's a hard one. It is a hard one, which is why I'm going to take like a step in answering it and then our powers combined can tackle it from various angles. Um, because to me, I think the topic of religion is a values-based um, one, right? And, and so it there are many ways that values can appear in sex education. Um, and I think we are able, like it, when teaching a class, you're able to acknowledge that people are coming in with a variety of different experiences and backgrounds and identities and um, different relationships to religion. Um, and it's kind of similar to identity, people's relationship to their religion can also evolve um, as time goes on. I'm sorry, my dog's having the zoomies behind me. Um, but I think one one journey that I know we've been on within Planned Parenthood is um, how we do talk about sexual orientation and gender identity in a classroom. And even if somebody is in the classroom who might have negative feelings about somebody who isn't straight or cisgender, um, we don't look at it as, well, everyone has lots of different opinions about LGBT people. Um, I think that's something that may have been more normal um, years ago. And for us, it's just extremely important that that actually isn't a value-based statement. Um, LGBTQ people are valid and all of those identities are absolutely wonderful. And um, everyone knows for themselves you know, how they identify. And that is something that we're not questioning or 
really putting any value on because it's just who somebody is inherently. Um, I might not be doing the most eloquent way of addressing it, but I, it's just a really interesting question too because I think it's something that um, our field has kind of evolved in how we've addressed as well in, um, in our classrooms. I think what Laura, I think what you just said, Laura, like, you know, one of the things that we've always done from the beginning with Scarletine as a community space, and, you know, we were trying to do these international community spaces online before anybody was doing them. So we were kind of learning to try and do them and moderate them by the seat of our pants is that we always had very firm ground rules. You know, and one of and you know one of the ground rules was always that we're not going to have arguments about if it's okay for anybody, right? We're not going to have an argument about you have these feelings about it is or isn't okay for somebody to be gay, or it is it or isn't okay for somebody to be trans. You get to have whatever feelings you have about that, but we're not going to talk about those feelings here because we're all here right now and we have to coexist in this community, right? And that's just how it is. And by and large, you know, every now and then we've had some youth that that's been an issue with. And obviously it's tricky in a different space than it is with us because we're an entirely elective space, right? It's not a classroom, right? So that person that like, you know, we can be like, well, you can just leave which they can, right? Like if you don't like it here. Now, that would be my vote for everyone in their educational spaces as well, quite frankly. But, you know, I don't get to make these decisions in the world. But for the most part, that's actually worked out just fine with the young people. And my, my even with really evangelical young people, my experience by and large is that I actually think that most of them find those boundaries refreshing because I actually think that most of that super intensity about other people's identities isn't theirs, it's inherited, it's their parents, it's the other adults, they feel an obligation to parrot a lot of it. And I feel like having it so that they can't and it's off of them to not even have to do it is more times than not what they actually want anyway and then it's not on them right like so it's not it's not there it's whether or not they do it it's it's not on them you've decided for them that they can't do it here can i add one quick um tool? yes please this please. is and this is like a, kind of parroting exactly the message that you both were saying heather and laura but in a classroom one tool to kind of get ahead of that um as you were saying, Heather, is to like prior to any lesson to co-create group agreements about how you're going to hold the space and make sure that respect is one of those agreements and um, to, you know, consider your words or actions before you say them and make sure they won't be harmful. And then if something like that arises in class, you can reference those group agreements and I, I recommend keeping them on the wall so that I can kind of just nip it right in the bud. Yeah, yeah, I think, I think that that's super helpful. Um, okay, we have a question uh, from Christopher. Um, thank you all for being here. How do you see your work connecting with the work of credentialed health education teachers in K through 12 schools? How would you like to see those connections grow or change? can go. You know, at Scarletine, we like to think of ourselves as a support and a reference. You know, we think of ourselves as a support in terms of having a whole bunch of information and resources. You know, it's free, right? So it's available for anybody to use um, and adapt, right? And also use as a model when you have people asking, I saw somebody asking for how do you use inclusive language? That's you go read a bunch of other people using inclusive languages, you know, one of the ways to do it, or go look at our message boards and see us in conversation with somebody else. In terms of, you know, for us, how to grow and change that, it's what we provide has really always been, it's mostly what our users ask us for, 
But if we had more educators saying, hey, we actually, if you could really also write more of these resources for us, we could really use X, Y, Z thing, we would probably hop right on it. So just asking us for more of what, what people need and how we can help, that's, that's what we do. We offer, a big part of what we do is offering professional development training and sessions for educators. Um, and so sort of helping directly transform whatever curricula are already in schools to be more queer and trans affirming in addition to um, the actual curriculum, which, you know, our vision is that at some point it can be implemented much more widely across um, public schools. But that was an amazing offer that Heather just made. So I really encourage everyone to take her up on it, take them up on it, pardon me. Yeah, I'll add real quickly. I mean, obviously include is likely not going to be implemented um, into health courses immediately, um, which is, it's fine. I feel um, so great about health educators educating themselves and um, becoming more well-versed in language and um, thinking critically about the lessons they're using. Um, I also know that sometimes that's easier said than done. You don't always know where to look, um, although Scarlet Teen's a really great place to start. And um, we also have a professional development um, virtual program that our affiliate has been working on for several years. And some of it is focusing on kind of the foundational courses of that any like sexual health educator would need like um, anatomy and relationships and consent, et cetera. Um, and as well as more um, getting into additional content related to um, you know, LGBTQ inclusive and affirming sexual health education. Um, so I can put the link in the chat if you're curious about it, especially in this um, current virtual world that we're all living in. I think it's helpful to um, have those additional opportunities and just to learn from some of the experiences that are happening around the country and some of the lessons learned that other folks have already been through. So you can, uh, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Thank you. Um, okay, I'm gonna do now some kind of rapid fire questions that are a lot of the like how to uh, questions that we've received so far. So the first one from Elizabeth, um, what are some of the most important things that you think queer and trans youth should know but may not know? Who wants to take it? <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna dive in. Um, you know, it's one of those questions that you can sit with for like an hour, and in an hour, I'll think of like the perfect thing. But I'm just gonna go with my gut right now. Um, I mean, I think the reality is we all, including queer and trans youth, like they're living in a culture and a society in our country that is not set up for their success. And so I just think it's so important and empowering to be reminded of that um to to know that like this is not your fault that these like especially you know if you're going to be sharing any hard information like around like statistics or a lot of those disparities that we talked about early on in our conversation like this is a result of systems that are um well prejudiced <laughs> and and um i i'm not being very eloquent about it i just think that being really crystal clear that like their identities are valid and beautiful and all of their experiences are um, are wonderful, even though that might not be what they're used to seeing represented in the world around them. Um, I think it's, it's, it's a fairly vague, big, big picture answer, but I think the more that, I think that's one of the, the things I really appreciate about our program is we're kind of just normalizing a conversation that I wish was normalized everywhere. Um, and so that's kind of where I start. No, I think that's such an important point to recognize that, you know, queer and trans identified folks or, you know, I mean, that's the language that we're using now, but, you know, throughout human history, right, that these kinds of relationships and um, experiences of, of humanity have, have existed. That's really powerful. Does anybody else want to jump in and share? Well, I think what I'd add to that also is that everybody else 
is a little more queer and trans than they know. You know, I mean, like that's that's really the other thing is that, you know, it's certainly not, it's not easy for us to live in the world as it is and to be around there. And we are not, it is not our responsibility to make the world easier for people for whom it is already easier. But the fact of the matter is, is that we do, you know, like, you know, the, for, for what we go through and the visibility that we give to, to having this kind of fluidity makes people more aware of that there are less limitations than they think there are. And so I think that's the other thing is that when you can look, if it feels very isolating, that it's kind of a you and them situation. Again, it's one of these things where that, that line is, is it's just not real. <laughs> you know, it's such an artificial thing, that line that's there. It's so mushy. Um, the older you get, I think the, the clearer it becomes, but it's, it's hard to see when you're younger. It's so funny that you say that, Heather, because I remember being, you know, in college and, you know, having these conversations where we were, you know, talking about our identities and, and like, like talking about it as a spectrum, but being like really like rigid in like where on the spectrum you are. And then, you know, I feel like in the last like 10 years, it's like, oh, and like, here is what the spectrum actually looks like, <laughs> um, which is amazing and beautiful. Well, and it's also when you have, when the question earlier about, you know, this concern about when people don't know who they are and the answer is, and it's what any of us that do this education tell young people every day, your whole life, it's changing. Unless you work really hard not to let it change, which some people do, and it really seems to make them suffer, but your whole life. It's, it's changing, maybe not in major ways and maybe only when you look back over many decades, is it clear? Because sometimes it's slow, but it, you, you, you never, there's never any like, okay, now I know how I identify and who I am for the whole rest of my life, forever and ever. Like that's, that's never, ever a thing. No. <laughs> um. Okay, this next question um, comes from Drew and it was directed, I think mainly towards Mira. Um, can you share some examples or illustrations of what an embodiment exercise would be? Sure. Um, so some of the embodiment activities, some examples are we do a mindfulness practice. We do um, a body scan, which is like also a mindfulness practice. We have, and please keep in mind, these are for <clears throat> K through four grades. So we have an activity called the wiggle worm, which, you know, has students get up and like shake their bodies. We have a short dance party. Um, there's a great activity called an intuition gauge, which asks, um, it's a tool to like get students to learn to hear and feel what yes what the experience of yes is in their body and what the experience of no is in their body. Um, and that's great for all ages as are the mindfulness practices. So is the wiggle worm, but it's a little juvenile. So those are some examples of embodiment practices that are uh, included in our curriculum, which our curriculum is, a, is like a 12 week. Yeah. But that's so beautiful because, you know, I feel, and there's, a, there's another question about teaching consent, but I know that the language around you know, enthusiastic consent or um, affirmational consent uh, is different than just consent and teaching kids to trust their own bodies and intuition in their, in their gut in developing these practices is so powerful. And I, and, you know, at, at um, the future of sex education, when we release the uh, national sex ed standards that you know, is um, an effort to really um, set a new floor for sex education that is embracing all of these identities and values and, and, and teaching folks. And we talk about the scaffolding, like that's the, the perfect kind of scaffolding to then be like, what is, a, what is enthusiastic or affirmational consent feel like and how different it is from somebody feeling, you know, obligated or pressured, right? Um, so. Yeah, I love that. that information 
only lives in our body before mm -hmm. it becomes cognitive. Yeah, and yeah, it just, that's such a great way of teaching, you know, young kids to trust what's happening internally and in, 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 in the face of external pressure around um, expectations of behavior. Um, okay, so then the last question uh, that I thought of as sort of like a rapid response is, um, what resources do you recommend for teaching consent skills to young people? So that's a good one. <laughs> Remember, you haven't um, pitched in for a while. Do you want to share your best practice tips for teaching consent? Totally. Um, I am taking inspiration here from, um, well, I am lucky enough to be able to work with a program where I get to have teens help me teach about sexual consent with teens. Um, so that um, in the past has been really um, helpful to pick apart both like specific behaviors and whether they are like consensual or not. So just having a um, just compilation of different like, yes, nah, nope, or like turns away or like just all of those examples and having youth sort them um, to kind of like understand kind of the, the nuances of like some folks will think that is consent. Some folks will think that's like a yellow light and we need to check in. And so helps bring about this conversation about what consent can look like, how the definition of consent um, can kind of, it can be defined in different ways for folks. So we can talk about a verbal yes, body language. We can talk about consent of one thing is not consent to another and process. Um, lately, I've been having a lot of conversations around consent and, and um, our own like bodily precautions connected to the pandemic, whether or not we want to hang out or hug, um, those check-ins and what they look like and sound like, and then using those examples um, to kind of like then extrapolate around sexual consent if we need to. Um, but that has been a really present um, uh, conversation starter about what consent looks like. Um, and in the INCLUDE program as a whole, I think as we go through safer sex skills, as we go through what sex means, um, like the definition of sex um, and, and what risks are presented with different behaviors, then we start talking about informed consent. What do we need to know to interact with um, and to choose to do these behaviors of our own autonomy and volition? Um, so those were all off of the top of my head, but um, I definitely, I'd love to hear anyone else. <laughs> I love all the, yeah, all of the things that Forever suggested are definitely things that we like to do. I think too, I love that you brought up with the pandemic. I think sometimes, especially with um, younger kids when you're doing it, but then also too with adolescents who maybe are just kind of like, have only really had consent talk in a sexual context. When you can take it out of a sexual context sometimes, it's helpful to just kind of unload it and put it somewhere else. I think that sometimes for some people it's either a little too much or it just gets too tangled up with other stuff that when you can kind of put it in other places. But I also think it's important you know, to remind everybody that of course you know, our consent matters everywhere right it, it matters with with every kind of touch it matters with every kind of interaction that we have with everybody and i think that's always kind of a helpful thing there because it's easy to get super in the weeds when it comes to what is and isn't sex especially with certain with certain adolescents sometimes and then and then all hope is lost but i also think that um, when you can kind of unload that conversation and just talk about things like, again, are you going to hug your friend right now um, or not hug your friend? Are you going to wear a mask right now or not wear a mask? Is it okay for the person cutting your hair to touch your shoulders or to not touch your shoulders? Do you want to kiss your grandma or not kiss your grandma? Like, I think that yeah. taking it out of a sexual context can be really helpful sometimes. Um, we are at time. Um, we did get one last question that kind of got snuck in in the chat um, from Justine. 
um, talking about the challenge of, of getting parents on board. And um, Justine says, you know, I think most school teachers and staff are on board, but are stressed and worried about parental reaction when it comes to being inclusive. The last thing teachers want to deal with is an angry parent on the phone or emailing them. Um, you know, what are some tips for overcoming this fear and possible reaction from parent groups? We don't have time to answer that question now, but if any of you have thoughts in regards to that and want to send them over to me, I'd be um, happy to share them with participants. Um, you know, I think that as we start speaking more affirmatively and, um, and you know, with less fear about the importance and the broad um, applications of the value of sex education, you know, we are seeing conservative spaces get really animated around these ideas. And so I do think that this becomes one of those push-pull um, conversations in our country at this moment. Um, and I think it's really important for us to recognize and realize that um, the reality of is that most parents want comprehensive sex education to be taught. And there is a vocal minority um, in dispelling a lot of the myths that are being perpetuated by folks who um, have an ulterior agenda is I think really critical for um, providing um, tools for folks to be able um, to push back on these things. But we're, um, I just wanna say thank you um, to everyone for, for your participation, to all of our speakers. I mean, you're doing such amazing work and it's really so important. And I wanna thank you for, for participating, for being here, for sharing your truths and knowledge and great ideas and resources. Um, this is being recorded. We will share um, a closed captioned um, version of the recording once that has been done. Um, we will be hosting another CECUS online, and I think Charlie asked the question um, specifically looking at comprehensive sex ed for youth with disabilities and, and expanding what does that look like in a broader inclusive um, fashion. Uh, and so I hope that uh, those of you who enjoyed this conversation will continue to join us um, and have a wonderful evening and thank you all so very much. Have a great evening.